Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eben Weitzman. I'm the director of the Graduate Programs in Conflict Resolution, part of the Department of Conflict Resolution, Human Security, and Global Governance here. Um, welcome to our annual Sylvia and Benjamin Slomoff Lecture in Conflict Resolution. We're extremely honored to be joined this, this afternoon by Professor Jim Sedanius, who is one of the great social psychologists of our time, a leading thinker on questions of intergroup conflict and the psychology of inequality. We're also joined by several important members of our own UMass Boston community, in particular, uh, Dean David Cash, the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies, and Provost Winston Langley, who has been a great champion and supporter of our programs and department going back to our founding. Uh, I want to say a couple of words about our benefactor, Ben Slomoff, who uh, has been funding this speaker series since the late 90s. Um, ben is one of the most inspiring people I've ever met. After high school, Ben went to work selling shoes. He left the shoe business to serve in the armed forces in World War II, and after a somewhat extended career in the armed forces, I think it was something like 14 years, he then went to work selling shoes. He wound up owning a successful shoe company, which he ran for many years, including a couple of factories here in Massachusetts. After retirement, he came to UMass Boston for his bachelor's degree, and then in his 80s, came and did first a certificate and then a master's in conflict resolution with us. Ben now still mediates and arbitrates. He currently has several multi-million dollar cases on his docket. And over the last few years, he's published two books of his own poetry. This past November, Ben turned 103. Ben couldn't be here today, but he sends his best wishes and his apologies for not making it. Ben is apologizing at 103 for not traveling cross country to be here. Um, we're joined today by Ben's grandson, Brian Green, who's a physician in, and the chair of the city of Somerville's Board of Health, um, and by their longtime family friend and another generous supporter of our program, Nancy Sonneman. Thank you so much, Brian and Nancy, for being here with us today. Each year since 1999, with Jen's, Ben's generous support, we've held the Slomoff Lectureship. This has been one of our most exciting events each year. The Slomoff Lectureship has brought us some of the most well-known and influential people in our field, including Mort Deutsch, Herb Kelman, and Barbara Bunker, all social psychologists, Dennis Ross, shortly after he left the State Department, Eric Green, who spoke about mediating the Microsoft antitrust case, John Marks of Search for Common Ground, Christiana Figueres, who was Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the mediator and author Bernie Mayer, Professor Richard Hackman, one of the world's leading experts on teams, late of Harvard University, and last year, Trita Parsi, founder and president of the National Iranian American Council, and many more. Today, in Jim Sedanius, we welcome a great thinker on questions of intergroup conflict and the psychology of social dominance. Professor Sedanius's work has been extremely important for my own work on intergroup peace building in the Middle East, and I am absolutely delighted to be able to welcome you here today. First, David Cash joined us in 2015 as Dean of the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies after a remarkable career, both in and out of academia. He's been a policymaker, environmentalist, mediator, mediator, author, and teacher. He's had senior positions in the Massachusetts government at the Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Public Utilities, and more and more. He's been a research fellow and lecturer in environmental science and public, science and public policy at Harvard, and he has taught middle school and high school, which is where I would not dare to tread. Fearless leader of exciting and growing school, please join me in welcoming David Cash. Thank you, uh, Evan. It's uh, it's great to be here, and it is uh, uh, true his uh, his fear of uh, middle school is warranted. <laughs> I pro I wish I had taken my negotiation and mediation courses before middle school. Uh, that would have served me well. It's still the hardest job I've ever had. Um, but um, it's great to be here and great to be part of, uh, of this lecture. And and uh, Professor Sedanius, it's wonderful to have you here today. Um, the uh, and welcome. Uh, I'd love to talk to you about the shoe industry because my, uh, my, I never met him, but my grandfather-in-law came from Hungary in 1906 penniless and eventually ended up owning, at, a at the time, one of the larger shoe companies in the East Coast. 
um, out of nothing. And uh, uh, perhaps uh, he and, uh, and, uh, and your grandfather interacted. I would be surprised if they did not. In the, in the years before Nike and Converse and, and the mega shoe companies, I'm sure uh, they knew each other. So I'd love to talk to you about that more. Um, so the, the McCormick Graduate School uh, equips future leaders with tools to enhance governance, strengthen communities, remedy injustices, catalyze change, and in, improve our planet and the lives of people across generations. And it seems like this series uh, is exactly in that sweet spot. Um, where we bring in experts as varied as, as uh, Evan just described from all over the world to talk about the multiple different ways that our research and understanding of how humans relate to one another uh, can help chart a future that's more peaceful and more productive and more sustainable. And uh, so it's a pleasure to host, um, host this, uh, this series. As uh, Evan also noted, uh, the, the Conflict Resolution, Human Security, and Global Governance Department has a number of different programs. Um, and uh, Conflict Resolution, the Graduate Certificate and Master's Program is only one of those, but we have a PhD in Global Governance and Human Security and a Master's in International Relations as well. And perhaps one of the best ways to kind of frame the programs is to think about where some of our alums are. And uh, this, is a, this is an incredibly short list. Um, in fact, I, 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 on one of my first week, my first week here when I was preparing for the first day that I was going to give a, you know, that exciting welcoming talk to the school, and uh, some of my staff had put together, uh, and we were doing slides like this, put together the list of alums. It was one of those problems where I had to make it like eight point on a slide and we had 10 of these slides of incredible things that people are doing. But here's just a, a couple. And um, our, the con convocation speaker for UMass Boston in 2011 was Jamie Kirsch, who went on to be the Presidential Management Fellowship as a conflict prevention officer in the Office of the, uh, of the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization at the US State Department. Camilo Azkarate went on to be the ombudsperson for Princeton and is now manager of mediation services at the World Bank. Deborah Mendez is now the Director of Mediation Services for the United Nations. Colin Rule was eBay and PayPal's first Director of Online Dispute Resolution and now CEO of Modria Inc., which is a company that helps other companies with conflict resolution. And Belle Abaya, who passed away in 2012, served as spokesperson to the President of the Philippines and in October 2009, she was appointed uh, by President Arroyo as the Philippines President's Peace Advisor. So what, this was just half a dozen, and we, you know, very hard to choose which ones, uh, because all of them sound uh, this incredible. The, 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 the department, uh, there are many different projects that span the world, whether it's uh, dealing with restorative justice right here in Boston, or peace issues in Ecuador, or in the Middle East, or in Nigeria, we're all over the world and we're close to home, addressing very similar kinds of problems. And um, as Eben very quickly noted, and the provost will talk more in detail, Professor Sedanius, who works on a general model of, this is, a, this is from his website, and I want to say it specifically, because he works on a general model of the development and maintenance of group-based social hierarchy and social oppression. And if you were to pick up the New York Times today, or the major paper in Paris, or a major paper in South Africa, or Tokyo, or Nigeria, or in Peru, uh, chances are the headlines are addressing and reporting about issues related to group-based social hierarchy and social oppression and conflict between groups based on identity, et cetera. And it's hard to imagine a more important time for you to be here today, and that's unfortunate to say. And maybe we would have said that three or four years ago if we were standing here, but those of us who've been in this business uh, uh, for many feels like there's a sea change right now, or at least a sea change that needs to be addressed and, and um, understood better and fought. And uh, the work that you do um, is incredibly important at these times. Um, and uh, so it's, it's wonderful to have you here today. Um, I want to now call up our, our provost who, as an educational leader, um, I think is rare in understanding the work that goes on in this department and how important that work is in an, in an educational setting and in a higher education setting. 
and in a public research university higher education setting. And uh, I think when people kind of laugh at the complexity of the name of this department, which we routinely do, we laugh at ourselves about conflict resolution, human security, and global governance. And I will say it is not a lie that when I came here to, uh, to interview for this job, I had note cards with me on my way in to make sure I'd remember that name. Um, and the reason it's so complicated is that the world is a complicated place and that uh, you can't think about these issues in, with one discipline. Uh, if you, again, if you remember back to Eben's discussion of the people who have been here, there were psychologists and sociologists and public policy people and economists, and I mean, it's just incredible. And, uh, and Provost Langley has been at the forefront of understanding that, giving the resources and the support for the development of these kinds of programs so that we can send off the kinds of people that I uh, listed earlier and that we can invite on this campus leaders uh, who address us. So, Professor Lang. Thank you, Dean Cash. And Professor Weitzman. Good afternoon to new guests, to longtime supporters of the Slomov lectureship, to visiting colleagues, to professors and students, as well as members of the staff, including members of the central administration. It is my humble but happy task to introduce our speaker. And it is with pleasure that I do so. I hope you'll allow me, however, to say something about his focus and put it in some sort of context in international relations that it has been part of a project launched in November of 1945, even before the Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the Genocide Convention. After World War II, it was thought a new world order was being created. It was to be a special project that of a progressive elimination of ignorance, inequality of individual and races, and of the substituted prejudice and discrimination which was said to have consumed secret social and public spaces in the form of ideologies. These took the place of the equality and dignity of all human beings. It was understood that those prejudices associated with the discrimination which people experienced were the principal causes of the morally unpardonable war. This is what the Constitution, Constitution representing the world at large of the United Nations Scientific, Educational and Cultural Organization says to and ask of us. In Article 2 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we call it the Majestic Non-Discrimination Clause we learn that everyone is entitled, without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political and other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. I repeat, or other status that everyone is entitled 
the rights and fundamental freedoms contained in the Declaration. That was in December of 1945. In 1972, under considerable hierarchy attenuating pressures, as the language of our uh, uh, speaker would suggest, of women and women's groups, especially the National Organization for Women, Congress passed the Equal Rights Amendment. It states, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. As you know, the fight to secure a two-thirds support of states to ratify it fell short by three. By 1994, a tactic was devised to overcome the failure to secure the support of the amendment. What well, was placed before con Congress was the 1979 UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Were it ratified, it was claimed, there would be no need for an Equal Rights Amendment. And so people hinged their hopes on this comprehensive focus that the convention contained. I'd like to read for you its definition of discrimination. For purposes of the present convention, the term discrimination against women shall mean any distinction, exclusion, or restriction made on the basis of sex which has the effect or purpose of impairing or nullifying the recognition, enjoyment, or the exercise by women, irrespective of marital status, on the basis of equality with men, with all human rights and fundamental freedoms, in the political, economic, social, cultural, civil, or any other field. The convention is still before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Our speaker, in his focus on the theory of gendered prejudice and a social domination and intersectional perspective, may very well shed some light to us tonight to enlighten us why the difficulty of dealing with these recognized, conflict-laden, human-endangering forms of discrimination. Why do they linger with us? Why do they have this hold on us? And who is our speaker? Well, you heard something about him earlier. I'm going to mention just a few other things. He's, as they indicated, Professor Sidanius, the John Lindsay Professor of Psychology in the memory of the great William James and of African American Studies in the departments of psychology and African American studies at Harvard University. His research interest is in the area of social dominance theory, but his current focus includes the political psychology of gender, group conflict, institutional discrimination, and evolutionary psychology of intergroup conflict. He's been the recipient of a number of major awards, including the 2006 Harold Laswell Award. And those of us who are not acquainted with Laswell, he was the dominant figure in the area of political psychology, including uh, dealing with international relations. He's 
and this award for distinguished scientific contribution in the field of political psychology. Now, I don't have to go through Dean Cash's focus to see how much we need social psychology in an understanding of intergroup conflict and in an understanding of how we might deal with a world that seems to be progressively launched on exclusion rather than the inclusionary focus uh, of the post-World War II order. In 2013, he is awarded the Career Contribution Award by the Society for Personality and Social Psychology. This university, which prides itself as a leader in the area of inclusion, is pleased to welcome Professor Jim Sedanius, who is not only a leader in his field, and perhaps which people will say the leader in his field, a fellow moral fighter against discrimination, but one who, in an affirmative vein, seeks to support the full responsibilities of participation, the joy of independence, and the fulfillment and gladness of truly self-determining state of being for all, including women and all who fall within the intersections of the many categories that I've mentioned. Welcome, Professor Sudenius. Well, I'm really very pleased to be here and flattered to be at the Slomov um, lecture series. And I am impressed by how gracious, how graciously I've been treated and met by the people in this program. I'm a refugee of the American Civil Rights Movement. And after having participated in it for many years, I came to the conclusion that despite the undeniable progress that civil rights has made in the United States, that the purposes of the movement were not fulfilled, that civil rights movement has been actually a failure. And it's a failure by not achieving its ideals of making race and gender irrelevant criteria for what happens to a person in life. And that's just not the case, despite our progress. And that prompted me to, take, to step back and take another look at the, the, the dynamics of oppression, racism, and sexism. And I developed the theory together with a colleague of mine, Felicia Prado, a social dominance theory. And what this theory starts out by saying is that human social systems appear to be structured as group-based hierarchies with one or a small group of, of groups at the top of the system and others <clears throat> at the bottom of the system. And this seems to be a ubiquitous phenomenon. Secondly, the basic assumptions we make are that human social systems seem to be predisposed to organize themselves as group-based social hierarchies. Secondly, the most common forms of social oppression we know, like sexism and racism and nationalism and religious intolerance, et cetera, are really simply special instantiations of this general tendency to form and reform group-based social hierarchies. And we argue that there are at least three different systems, related but distinctly different systems, of group-based hierarchy. 
One of these systems is the age system, in which adults, variously defined, have more social and political and military power than children. This is uncontroversial, this distinction. The next distinction is a little more controversial and basically argues that gender is another ubiquitous social system in our species. The degree of sexism and high patriarchy varies somewhat from society to society, but the existence of patriarchy seems to be a human universal. Now, there are some exceptions to this in the related animal kingdom. And the exceptions, one species is an exception, which is the bonobo. Bonobos have a social system which is genuinely matriarchal rather than patriarchal. So that's one exception. A second exception is to be found among the Moriki or New World monkey in which there's no dimorphism between male and female bodies, and the social system they've established is rather gender egalitarian. So that's the second exception. A third exception is found among the various species of lemur, which are, tend to be patri matriarchal in their structure. That is to say, the females have more political, social, and uh, determinative rights than the males do. And lastly, <clears throat> a major exception to this general rule of patriarchy is found among the spotted hyena of Africa. And this is a species in which the gender roles seem to be flipped. The female animal is bigger, stronger, more aggressive than the male is. And to the extent to which this species has social structure and political structure, that political and social structure tends to be matriarchal. But these are basically the only exceptions to this tendency. Human beings together with chimpanzees, gorillas, uh, and other members of the hominoid clad are patriarchal in structure and function. And lastly, the third form of group-based hierarchy we call the arbitrary set system. These are socially constructed distinctions between in-group and out-group, examples of which can be found as tribes, races, classes, clans, religions, lineage, and minimal groups, or any other artificial distinction people are willing and able to make between group A and group B. Out of this general reasoning comes the notion of the racial oppression as a form of arbitrary set discrimination, and which is, we're going to argue, deeply gendered and just thus inescapably interactional and intersectional. And so the basic theme of this talk is to try to convince you that we really cannot understand the dynamics of arbitrary set discrimination without appreciating the fact that it is a gendered phenomena. And how does that come about? Well, what are the theoretical underpinnings of this? And this is the introduction, our introduction, of the theory of gendered prejudice. And it basically finds its roots in Robert Trivers, who was an evolutionary biologist, in a thesis called the Parental Investment Theory. And this theory argues that because males and females are confronted with qualitatively different challenges and risks, as a process of reproduction, their psychologies are somewhat different. So for instance, the obligatory reproductive investment of males ends after the relatively costless production of millions of sperm 
and the act of fertilization. Secondly, however, females bear a relatively high obligatory cost in birthing, lactation, and the insig not insignificant risk of death in childbirth. Following this, human males and females also differ in their, the length of their reproductive lifespans, where males can, are reproductively capable a much longer period of their life cycle than are females. Next, we argue that because of these gender differences in the costs and risks of reproduction, the Psych the reproductive psychologies of males and females will be slightly different. And most importantly, that these differences and um, feedback between male and female reproductive strategies have political and political consequences, socio-political consequences. <clears throat> So the general model looks like this, basically, that we argue that parental effort by females will be more likely to be emphasized and mating efforts by males more emphasized. This will have behavioral consequences and differences for males and females. So a relative among females, there'll be a relatively high Choosing, may choosiness, a relative high investment in offspring, and a tendency to select mating partners who are of high status and willing to devote those status and resources to her offspring. Among males, however, their mating strategies will be characterized by relatively high sexual promiscuity, high striving for status and power, and male and high levels of male on male competition. Now the argument is that the feedback between female and male reproductive strategies results in socio-political consequences of the following type. There are two of them. One is the production of patriarchy, that is to say, it is the male control of the sexual and social prerogatives of females. And the second form of consequence is what we call the arbitrary set hierarchy, which are dominance hierarchies among males primarily directed at other groups of males. And the extractive coalition of males against other groups of males. Now, there are three derivable hypotheses from this general reasoning. The first one is what we call the invariance hypothesis. That is to say that there will be main effect differences in the political psychology of males and females, which we'll go into in some detail later. The second hypothesis is what we call the outgroup male target hypothesis, which I'll explain in a little while. And the third one we call the gendered motives hypothesis. So let's go through these hypotheses one at a time. Hypothesis number one, the invariance hypothesis. This basically argues that xenophobia, social predation, and social dominance orientation will be significantly greater among males than among females. <clears throat> and how do we measure and operationalize this term called social dominance orientation, of which males are supposed to have higher levels of? Well, we've developed measures to assess this, and one measure to assess this is something we call the social dominance orientation scale. And selective items from it are things like to get ahead in life, it's sometimes necessary to step on other groups. Inferior groups should stay in their place. Superior groups should dominate inferior groups, and the obverse of all of these 
all groups should be given an equal chance in life. There are 16 items like this which measure this tendency to favor the production and the reproduction of group-based inequality. <clears throat> and the thesis is that given the reasoning I showed you in the, just now, that there will be a significant and consistent gender difference in this tendency. And this fact of a gender differences, difference between males and females regarding dominance orientation is probably the most well-supported finding in all of social dominance theory. And it seems not to interact with a bunch of possible moderators. It's consistent across nationality, ethnicity, religiosity, education, income, child rearing practices, levels of racism across gender role attitudes and across ideologies. The best evidence for the existence of this consistent main effect difference between males and females and the tendency to favor group-based inequality is found in a meta-analysis done by some colleagues of mine in 2011. And what they did was look at 101 different samples using 28,300 plus respondents across 16 countries. And what they found is not a single incidence in which, uh, instance in which males had a significantly lower level of SDO than females do across all of these samples. The second hypothesis that comes out of the general assumptions of the theory of group based of gendered, pre pre gendered prejudice is called the arbitrary <coughs> set. If we define ASD, this thing right here, as arbitrary set discrimination, then the thesis argues that the level of arbitrary set discrimination suffered by males will be larger than the level of arbitrary set discrimination suffered by females, which might or might not be greater than zero. Now, if you think about this for a second, this directly contradicts one of the popular notions within intersectional thinking, which is if females are um, discriminated against by virtue of their gender, and black females are also discriminated against by virtue of their race, then black females of subordinate in, uh, females should be doubly handicapped. But this argument that we're using says that that's just not the case, that females will suffer from the effects of sexism but not the double effect of sexism and racism, okay? Now, where's the proof of this rather counterintuitive finding or statement? We're gonna go through that in a minute. Third hypothesis, the gendered motives hypothesis, which basically says that the motives for arbitrary set outgroup discrimination will differ from males and females. Among males, but not among females, discrimination against arbitrary set groups will be substantially motivated by levels of aggression and social dominance orientation. And that will not be the case for females. So let's look at some of the empirical evidence for this, for the outgroup male target hypothesis. There are three levels of support that we can find for this theory. The first level is looking at the lived experiences of individuals, males and females, from subordinate groups. And this is survey data. And there have been three major studies using survey data, simply asking males and females the, the degree to which they have suffered racial discrimination 
across a variety of domains. And those domains like shopping, dining out, at work, housing, <coughs> with the police, in public transport, and in education. Okay. These are the uh, domains in, in which uh, males generally experience greater levels of racial discrimination than females do. And these findings, and in the criminal justice system as well, have been found in the United States, the UK, and in Sweden. Okay. But this is the weakest form of evidence, and I'm not going to spend much time going over it. But one of the Swedish studies done by the Diskrimineringsombudsman in Sweden, asked immigrants to Sweden, males and females, from four different regions of the world, the degree to which they felt discriminated against by the Swedish society. And what you find is in three out of the four cases, among African immigrants, Arab immigrants, <coughs> Asians, and Yugoslavs, that the male immigrants dis experience higher levels of discrimination than did the females. But this is not convincing evidence. It's suggestive evidence, but we need to find out whether or not there really is differential levels of discrimination across gender for uh, arbitrary set discrimination. The second level of proof of evidence is the looking at archival data, which we're going to discuss. And the third level of evidence is experimental data. This is the, the best and most convincing evidence that exists within the social sciences, well-controlled experiments. Let's look at the archival evidence first in terms of hate crimes. These are data taken from um, the Bureau of Justice Statistics and uh, between 2000 to July of 2000 and December of 2003, and it looked at 210,000 cases of hate crimes against, directed against arbitrary set groups. And what you find is, the, on this legend here, we have the gender of the perpetrator of the hate crimes, and on the y ac and the x-axis, the gender of the victim of the hate crime. And by far, the combination of gender that is most strongly associated with the hate crimes is male victims uh, attacked by male perpetrators. Okay. By far outweighs any other combination. Looking at hate crimes against gays shows generally the same phenomena. In uh, 2007, the Bureau of Justice Statistics showed that of 86% of all the violent hate crimes against gays or directed against gay males, and only 13.7% were directed against gay females. What about employment discrimination? These are average per capita income levels of males and females, blacks and whites. And what you can see here is that controlling for nothing, there is a substantial difference in the yearly salary that white males make versus black males. They're about $10,000. The difference between black and white females is still to the white female's advantage, but not very strongly. There's a very minor difference in the incomes of these two groups of females compared to the rather large difference between these two groups of males. Well, that data controls for nothing. It it's looking at just raw means. 
So we don't know what the, what the differences are in human capital investment for these groups. So let's look at that. And here is a study done by Farley and Allen using 1960s data and 1980s data. And what it looks like, looks at on the y-axis <coughs> is the amount of return on yearly educational investment for every additional year you go to school. So for instance, what this chart says is that in 1960, white males earned 78 cents more per hour for every additional year of schooling they got. So this is return in salary on educational investment. And this is, this is the data in 19, um, Sixty and eighty. In ninth, this is the 1960 data. In 1980, we see that white males earned substantially more in rates of return on investment than did black males. So these are black males in 60, and these are black males in 1980. However, if you look at the the rate of return on investment for me females. What you find is that among females, there is no evidence of racial bias in the rate of return for black females. The rate of return in investment is, if anything, slightly higher for black females compared to white females. In 1980, things got better. You got a higher rate of return on educational investment, but if anything, Black females got a higher rate of return than white females did. There's evidence of sexism here in that, in, in, on average, the rate of return in educational investment was higher for males than for females. But there's no evidence at all that there is a racial effect among females, none at all. So what we did is that that was done in 1960 data, 1980s data. So we went back to the data foundries and looked at census data from 2010 and found essentially the same phenomena. This is the y-axis represents rate of return on investment for every year you additional of schooling you got. And the people who got the highest rate of return were white males, followed by nobody, then followed by black males. But the difference in the rate of return for white and black females is really minuscule. What about controlling for looking at males and females, blacks and whites, when you control for possible confounding variables like we're going to go through that in a minute. This is taken, these are data taken from Bowen and Buck's book in 1976, looking at the graduating class in 76 and following them up 25 years later to see what happens to that graduating class. These are the raw differences between whites and blacks in per capita income. And you see that, again, whites, males, earn substantially more than black males do. And controlling for everything that they could think of, controlling for the prestige of the university you went through, to, the hours worked at the job, the majors you had, the whether you had a full-time or a part-time job, every variable they could think of and try to make this male difference of black males and white males, they couldn't make it go away. However, that's not the case for black and white females. Controlling for nothing, there's only a very slight difference in the per capita 
income given to white and black females. Once you put on all the controls, the differences between the females, white and black, completely disappears. Again, in these data, there's evidence of sexism. Everything else being equal, males earn more money than females do. But there is no evidence in these data for racial bias between females or among females controlling for confounding variables. Or what about the criminal justice system? These are taken from 2002, 2010 census, looking at the rate of imprisonment of males and females, blacks and whites and Latinos per 100,000 in the population. And what you first notice in this graph here is that there is a huge difference in the incarceration rate of males versus females. This should be no surprise. What's more interesting is what the relative difference is between the genders and the races for each of these combinations. So if we look at the Latino-white ratio, we see among females, we see that Latino females are imprisoned at somewhat higher rates than white females are imprisoned. But if you look at males, that differential imprisonment rate is substantially greater. Among the black-white uh, contrast, you see that among females, black females are imprisoned at about 2.8 times the rate that white females are. But black males are imprisoned at about 6.7 times the rate that white males are. So again, not that there's no evidence of racial bias against Latino and black females, is that the intensity of that arbitrary set discrimination is higher among males than among females. Here's an experiment done by uh, Ashby Plant and her colleagues looking at the shoot-no-shoot -shoot paradigm in which these research subjects are shown a quick picture of a male or a female, black or white, with an ambiguous object in their hands. And the two kinds of mistakes that people can make. The white bars is accidentally shooting unarmed targets or accidentally not shooting armed targets. And if we look at the white boxes for a minute, we see that there is no difference in the probability of white and black females being shot accidentally when they're unarmed. However, for black males, there's a much higher rate chance of being shot if they're unarmed. Okay. Interestingly enough, the, the, there is also a, mis a tendency not to shoot armed white females. Okay. But the contrast of interest for us is the difference between the probability of being accidentally shot if you're a black female versus a white female, and there are no differences there. What about experimental evidence? This, evi this uh, study looked at the probability of being fined or taxed on the basis of your uh, ethnic group membership. And what we have here on the y-axis is the money that you could lose or be taxed if you belong to a white male student organization or versus a black male student organization. And there are a range of different choices a test subject could make. They could either do the rational thing and charge everybody less money. So here, we're looking at losing or being fined $7,000 if you're uh, 
a white male, white male organization, but that's done at the cost of outgroup, black outgroup student organizations being charged only $1,000. But still, the most rational thing to do is to make this choice going to the right. If you're being vindictive and targeting um, objects, you're going to go to the left. That is to say, everybody, the disadvantage is, everybody gets taxed more, except the advantage is that the outgroup gets charged tax significantly more than the in-group does. Now, what are people going to choose? To be taxed more, to stick it to the outgroup, or to be taxed less and pay, be taxed more than the outgroup? Well, the data seems to show that the kinds of choices that people make here depend upon the gender and sex of the allocator and the gender and sex of the target. So if you're looking at female organizations and white male and female respondents, there's no real difference in the rate of taxation. If anything, it goes towards the negative. That is to say, people tend to tax the outgroup less and uh, the outgroup and the in-group. For male targets, under the condition of female respondents, there's also a tendency, right here we can see, to go towards the negative, taxing everybody less, even at the cost of taxing the outgroup less than the in-group. There's one exception, one interaction, which is quite substantial. That is, when male respondents were taxing male targets, outgroup targets, the tendency was to do a spiteful allocation. That is to say, tax the outgroup more, even at the cost of having to pay more money in fines for your group. Experimental evidence looking at employment discrimination. This was a series of studies we did for our book looking at the rate of workplace discrimination based upon the gender and sex of, this, of the job seeker. And it was an audit study. And what audit studies are, the white and black are minority and a majority job seeker had the same educational background, the same grades, the same credit history, the same everything. The only thing that differed was the sex and gender. And this series of studies was done by looking at the contrast between discrimination rates of whites versus Indians, white versus uh, East Indians, native whites versus Greek immigrants, et cetera. These are all of the combinations. What the data showed is that if you adjust for nothing, there's a slight tendency for male outgroup members to be discriminated against at slightly higher rates than females are. It's that difference between the blue and the pink bars there. But after you make adjustments for education, the kind of job it is, or that's meaning the a job entails meaning the public or not, the amount of education demanded by the job, the differences in discrimination rates between male and female become quite sharp. That is to say, males are discriminated against at substantially higher rates than females are. This is an interesting study done by some colleagues of mine. In Sweden, looking at the discrimination rate of Arab-sounding 
immigrants with Arab-sounding names and the Swedish labor market. And the dependent variable here is the callback ratio. So whether or not after presenting your credentials you got a callback from the employer, yes, you have an interview. And what these data show is, controlling for nothing, that the, Arab, the job seekers with Arab-sounding names were discriminated against at about the high same rate as male, for males and females. That is to say, Swedish job seekers got callbacks at approximately twice the rate that the Arab-sounding job applicants got. And there's no gender difference. But then they made a change. They say, what would happen if the Arab-sounding name was associated with two more years of job-related experience compared to the Swedish job seeker? And this is what the data showed. For females, the callback difference between native Swedes and immigrants went away. It was no longer significant. If the Arab female had two more years of job-related experience, but that was not what happened with the male job applicant who had an Arab-sounding name. Here, you see, at the level of discrimination against these job applicants went even higher. Okay. A prepared fear paradigm. This is a set of experiments that does the following. It divides up stimuli in the world into two categories. Those that we're prepared to be afraid of, like poisonous snakes and spiders, and those that we're not prepared to be afraid of, like ducks and butterflies. Each pair of these stimuli are then associated with electric shock and noxious noise. So whenever you saw the CS plus um, exam exemplar, you were shocked. And when you saw this exemplar, you were not shocked. Oh, naturally, after a few trials like this, just seeing a picture of the conditioned stimuli resulted in a fear response compared to the uh, target that was not paired with a shock and electric noise. And the same thing was done to stimuli that were not prepared to be afraid of. So this picture was associated with shock and this wasn't. Well, naturally, what the data showed was that you just need to show a picture of this duck to get this fear response. But what they noticed was that the extinguishing period where the, when it was no longer associated with electric shock, the fear response difference or the skin response difference was no longer significant between these two pairs of objects. But when you took away the unconditioned stimulus, the difference in, um, or the fear response for the other object, or for this object, did not go away. It lingered. Once you were conditioned to fear a prepared stimulus, the fear, it didn't go away. Or two of our, bunch of our colleagues decided to apply this technique to human groups. Now imagine we're dealing with white subjects for a minute. For white subjects, pictures of other white males when they are not prepared to be afraid of them, particularly. But you are, they were prepared to be afraid of pictures of black males. And the same technique was used to see one pair from each of these, one example from each of these pairs was associated with electric shock and then the data were put through an extinguishing period to see how long that change lasted. 
And what they found was the following. Not only did people acquire the fear faster without group targets compared to in-group targets, but the, for the out-group targets, the fear, the conditioned fear of the face never went away, even when it was no longer being reinforced, if it was a male face. Well, these, this group of uh, researchers left out one important feature. They did not compare the responses, the differential responses, depending upon the gender of the target. And we reasoned that the gender of the target will make a huge difference. So well, we, we repeated the basic design of the experiment where the dependent variable was the galvanic skin response or the skin conductance response. The independent variables were exposure to condition stimulus, that is they say the pairing of electric shock, the race of the target, and the race and the gender of the target. And what the data show is the following, that among female targets, the extinction basically went to zero. These bars are not significantly different from zero. So that is to say, the conditioning went away when the targets were female. When the targets were in-group males, the fear response also went away. But when the target were out-group males, it did not go away. It lingered. In other words, it's the combination of the gender and the race of the target and the gender and the race of the allocator which makes all the difference. In other words, this is an intersectional finding. Another piece of evidence for this is found in a last study I'm going to talk about an extinction bias study, looking at the independent variables of aggression, social dominance orientation, gender of the target, and gender of the participant. Under which condition is extinction bias the strongest, is the question. We found no effect for female targets. It did not matter how we combine levels of SDO, high or low, for female targets, or levels of aggression for female targets. There was no difference in extinction bias. But that's not the case for male targets. For male targets, uh, the combination of high SDO scores, this black line, together with levels of aggression, were strongly associated with extinction bias. That is to say, if you're primed with a face of an outgroup male and you happen to have high levels of dominance orientation and high levels of aggressivity, you're going to show significant levels of extinction bias. So the overall conclusions are that we cannot comprehend the dynamics of racial oppression until we theorize it as some form of arbitrary set oppression, which is a deeply gendered phenomena. That is to say, the level of discrimination depends upon the combination of the out-group and in-group distinction together with the male-female distinction. Secondly, we found consistent evidence for the invariance hypothesis, there is a main effect for gender with regard to SDO, where males have a predilection to be more aggressive, dominance-oriented uh, towards outgroups than females are. And lastly, there is some evidence of the outgroup male target hypothesis. That is to say, the level of discrimination suffered by the individual will depend upon the interaction between the gender and the ethnicity or race 
of the target. And I think at that point, I will end it. Thank you for your attention. You have given us a tremendous amount to think about. And I know that I'm, I'm going to be thinking about um, the implications of all of this as we think about doing conflict resolution work, mm -hmm. to think about the psychology of males and females when in conflict. And uh, it's a question our students certainly raise all the time. And it's a question that we, we wrestle with in the field. And you've given us some important new stuff to work with. Okay, well, and thank, thank you. you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.